Good morning and welcome once again to this time of worship. We're at the fourth Sunday in Advent. Next Sunday is Christmas Day. During Advent, we look traditionally at four words, peace, hope, joy, and love. And as I light the candle, so we are reminded that the flame of each of those burns bright during this Advent season. Now we're going to sing one of the great Christmas carols, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, wherever we are at the moment, you are the one who calls us together, who joins us together, and you call us to worship. And even in your world, broken and groaning with so much that gives cause for pain and distress, you still give us good reason to worship. For you've placed us in a universe of wonder and grandeur. You've given us a world of beauty. You've given us people who enrich every moment of our lives. And at this season of the year, you give us reasons for hope and joy, which have nothing to do with the circumstances of our lives at any particular time. And so we come to express our gratitude and to offer our worship. Because you are worthy. 
Forgive us for the many times we've contributed to this world's brokenness by our selfishness and thoughtlessness. Forgive us when we've behaved as though this was our world and not yours. Forgive us when we've been part of broken relationships and when, we, when we've turned a deaf ear to the cries of need all around us. Forgive us, Lord, when we have chosen to ignore the example of selflessness set by the one born in Bethlehem. And forgive us also for the easy excuses we make for our failings. Help us in our weakness to again be able to receive him as Lord during this season, so that by our love, by our compassion, we may point a broken world to the one who alone is the source of peace and hope and joy and love. In the name of that one, even Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm going to read now two passages of Scripture. First from the Old Testament, from the prophet Jeremiah. From the prophet Jeremiah. Let's get that straight. Chapter 32 and reading the first 15 verses. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. The army of the king of Babylon was then besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was confined in the courtyard of the guard in the royal palace of Judah. Now Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him there, saying to Jeremiah, why do you prophesy as you do? You say, this is what the Lord says. I am about to give this city into the hands of the king of Babylon and he will capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, will not escape the Babylonians, but will certainly be given into the hands of the king of Babylon and will speak with him face to face and see him with his own eyes. He will take Zedekiah to Babylon where he will remain until I deal with him, declares the Lord. If you fight against the Babylonians, you will not succeed. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of Shalom, your uncle, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field in Anathoth, because as nearest relative it is your right and duty to buy it. And then, just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the guard and said, Buy my field in Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, since it is your right to redeem it and possess it, buy it for yourself. I knew that this was the word of the Lord, so I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out for him seventeen shekels of silver. I signed and sealed the deed, had it witnessed, and weighed out, on, weighed out the silver on the scales. I took the deed of purchase the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy, and I gave this deed to Barak, son of Neriah, the son of Marseah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, and of the witnesses who had signed the deed, and of all the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the guard. In their presence I gave Barak these instructions. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Take these documents, both the sealed and unsealed copies of the deed of purchase, and put them in a clay jar so they will last a long time. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. And then turning to the Gospel, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3. And the story of the coming into public ministry of John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3 and from verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. 
John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we thank God for those readings of his word. Amen. If you were with me a month ago when I last preached at one of these services, you will, I hope, remember that I focused then on the fact that God, although he may often be backstage or behind the scenes, as it were, that did not mean that God was absent. Well, today I want to take some of those thoughts a little further. Perhaps the fact that there are some similar ideas in what I'm going to say now and what I said then, perhaps that's a reflection of where I am in my own faith journey right now. And so we're well into what some people like to call the festive season. But I'm not sure that there's an awful lot to feel festive about. Just when you thought that things couldn't get much worse, we have the fallout from Pala Pala. And we have load shedding ramped up to level six or five or whatever it is at the moment with the threat of worse to come. And meanwhile, the tragedy of Ukraine continues and even in those 16 days of no violence against women and children, we still had some horrifying examples of gender-based violence. We've had kidnappings. We've had shootings, strikes, never-ending protests, and more. I'm not going to rehearse the whole litany of woes. You know them all too well. It's enough to make us feel despair, to feel hopeless for the future of this country and even for the world at large. Now the Advent word for today is supposed to be love. The others, you will remember, are peace and hope and joy. But frankly, after that litany of despair, I just found myself thinking that it's far too easy for us to slip into a kind of sentimentality as we think about those traditional words and our thinking becomes unrelated to the dismal realities with which we are confronted day by day. Now I know that Ross dealt with the word hope a couple of weeks back, so I hope he and you will forgive me if I go back to that word, because that is frankly the only one of those four Advent words that really speaks to me at the moment. We need a hope, a hope with substance. So I want to start by taking a brief look at John the Baptist, and then I want to line him up for a while with the prophet Jeremiah. And if that sounds a little bit odd, then hopefully all will become clear. John really did stick his neck out, didn't he? speaking so confidently of one who was to come and what would happen when he did. He risked antagonizing the religious authorities by all his talk about repentance and especially seeing as he didn't mince his words 
in talking about anyone, in particular the religious authorities. And he risked antagonizing the Roman authorities by his talk about a, a coming new order of things. I mean, the, the Romans were in charge, and they wouldn't take too kindly to that sort of talk, which they may well have interpreted as inciting rebellion. And remember, at this stage, Jesus had given no sign of what was to follow through his own ministry. And so John really had no evidence, no idea of what was actually going to happen. So there's a sense in which John's ministry was very much a matter of faith and hope. Even though there wasn't much definite evidence, John was still convinced that somehow God was at work. You know, I sometimes think back to 1994, when we in this country hailed the, the new South Africa. Hope burned bright, even though those with wisdom warned that there would be no quick and easy transition. But 28 years later, so much of that hope has dissipated. There are just too many things that concern and trouble us deeply. Right now, we have huge political uncertainty. We're faced with an economic roller coaster. We have rampant crime, violence. Corruption seems to raise its head all over the place with minimal accountability. And there are protests everywhere. And so on and so forth. Advent is supposed to be a time of hope and looking forward with expectation and joy. But the truth is, I suspect, that these days we tend to oscillate far too easily between hope and despair. Which I suppose is why it's good for us to be reminded of John the Baptist's confidence and hope even though the outward signs didn't appear to be too promising. And it was while I was pondering that aspect of John's ministry that I happened to read again that Jeremiah bought a field in Anathoth. Let me tell you the story of that field in Anathoth. The kingdom of Judah, with its capital at Jerusalem, had been conquered by the Babylonian armies. And many of the leading people had been taken off into exile. The people who were left behind, instead of just living quietly as subjects of Babylon, rebelled. They had hoped for help from Egypt, but Egypt proved a fickle ally. And so suddenly the little boy, Judah, found himself facing the bully, Babylon, alone. Quite obviously, Judah was heading for a heap of trouble. The Babylonian soldiers in their thousands had approached Jerusalem. They were camping just outside the city. And everyone inside the city knew that in just a few days, their city would be plundered. A lot of people would die. And many more would be taken as captives into exile. The future was about as bleak as it could possibly be. There was simply no hope. Now, Jeremiah was not exactly top of the king's popularity poll. In fact, while all this was going on, Jeremiah was loosely confined in prison. And it was from there, in prison, that he bought this field in Anathoth, a village just a couple of kilometers outside Jerusalem. It seemed a very strange thing to do, to put it mildly. It certainly made no investment sense. Even as he purchased it, the Babylonian armies were camping on it. He himself was in prison and there was no realistic prospect of him getting out. The enemy was preparing to attack. And most people, including possibly Jeremiah himself, would either die or be taken as captives into exile. As Jeremiah bought that field, he must have known that he would never be able to build a house or plant a tree on that, on that field. He would not in his lifetime be able to sell that field at a profit. In fact, there was a good chance that he might never even see the field in question. 
So why did he do this seemingly idiotic and futile thing? Well, he did it because he was absolutely convinced that God was at work in those events that were taking place around him, even those events that seemed so completely negative. Jeremiah believed that God would use those events in a way that would eventually prove to be for the good of his people. As one commentator put it, Jeremiah bought that field as an investment in God's next project for Israel. It was a defiant act of faith and hope in which Jeremiah preached a visual sermon. By buying that field, Jeremiah said in effect, preserve those title deeds, keep them, keep them in a clay jar so they'll last a long time. Because, thus says the Lord Almighty, no matter how bleak it looks at the moment, houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. In other words, this is not the end. There is a future for this land. You know, hope, real hope, I think only comes into its own when things seem superficially at any rate to be hopeless. And when we look at our own country and what's going on here, when we look at what's going on in the world at large, perhaps that's where many of us are. Because hopelessness is very easy. It was in the midst of despair, when there seemed to be little reason to hope, that Jeremiah spoke and acted out a word of hope. Jeremiah simply believed that God was at work. God would not renege on his promises. Let me say that again. God would not renege on his promises. God would not leave a work half done. What was happening in the land at the time may well have had some element of judgment about it. But Jeremiah knew that in God's scheme of things, judgment is never the last word. In their despair, the people needed to hear that there was a word of hope. And if they wouldn't hear that word, perhaps they would see it. And so he preached that visual sermon. And in a very public way, with a lot of people around, he bought his field. And in doing so, he spoke a word of hope. It seems to me that both Jeremiah and John the Baptist can say something to us in our land and in the world at large today. Yes, things are looking pretty grim on many fronts. We know that. But you may remember that in 1994, many of us were bold enough to believe that God was at work. And I want to believe that nothing has changed. Nothing has happened to change that fact. As Jeremiah recognized, sometimes there is a time of judgment that needs to be worked out. But that does not mean that the judgment is the last word. Always there's a word of hope. Now I know that sometimes what we refer to as hope is some, just not much more than a vague optimism. Hmm? But that kind of thing is just, frankly, frivolous and wishy-washy. Christian hope has got much more substance than that. It is born of faith. It is born of a conviction that God is at work. Both John the Baptist and Jeremiah had come to know that God is ultimately trustworthy. What God started... God would finish. And so both of them just continued to live out their lives, continued to act in the belief that God was working his purposes out. I want to suggest for us this morning that the Advent hope for us is based on the fact that God has, as it were, bought a field. Way back in Bethlehem, in a stable, God, in his never-changing love for the world, bought a field in this world. 
John the Baptist was the herald of that visible sermon that God preached about what he was intending as his next project with humanity. God has a future for this world. And Bethlehem is his visual sermon about that. And then in 1994, God in his love for this land in which we live, bought a field in South Africa. God brought about the changes for which so many had longed for so long. You know, it all seemed so unlikely at the time, didn't it? And so when it happened, many said, it is the Lord's doing and it's wonderful in our eyes. Again, it was God's visible sermon that he has a future for this land. And God will not leave a job half done. What God started, God will finish. The difficult, painful, and very often totally frustrating days through which we are living right now may well have an element of judgment about them. Our past is going to have certain consequences which will have to work themselves out. And call that judgment if you will. But remember, both John the Baptist and Jeremiah were quite clear that judgment was never God's final word. Advent, Christmas, reminds us that there will always be a word of hope. Not an easy optimism, but hope. God, in his love for us, has spoken and acted out a couple of visual sermons about hope. For the world, that visual sermon took place in Bethlehem. For us in South Africa, that visual sermon took place in 1994. God is at work in his world. God is at work in this land. And if we believe that, we will surely want to cooperate with him. We will surely want to be on his side, to work with him. Yes, sometimes that is difficult, I know, and it may seem futile. Both, neither John the Baptist nor Jeremiah tried to escape the fact that it would be difficult to be faithful to God. But their hope was strong enough. Their hope was determined enough for them to see beyond the difficulties. And maybe ours should be too. And why? Well, if we believe that other Advent word, the one that's actually set for today, the word love, then we will know that in difficult times, God does not leave us without hope. One could say that hope is God's Christmas gift of love to us today. So even though things are not what we would like them to be, we will continue working and praying for peace and for justice, for a cleaner world, for a crime-free, drug-free, gun-free, corruption-free, discrimination-free society. We will continue to stand against the abuse of children and violence against women. We continue to stand for a better society, a more God-pleasing society, even though sometimes it may seem that we're just whispering in the wind. But you see, it's in doing those things, it's in doing those things that we can preach a visual sermon as well. We can preach a visual sermon that illustrates that God is not absent those are the practical ways that we continue today to express the Advent hope. Those are the ways that demonstrate that the Advent hope has got substance because it actually does make a difference. And we are the people who are energized for that task by the Advent hope. Join me in prayer. Lord, in these difficult days, we thank you for your Christmas love gift of hope. 
As we seek to come to terms with the distressing things happening in your world and in our own country, may we never give way to a negative hopelessness. Enable us to be a people who through our own actions, our own attitudes, through our conviction that you are not absent, through our conviction that you will not leave a job half done, may we be a people who will preach a visual sermon as we strive for peace, as we offer hope, as we spread joy, and as we share love. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So hopefully we go into the days that lie ahead, knowing that we will walk the land with hearts on fire, and we will sing that song together. And every step will be a prayer Hope is rising, a new day dawning the sound of singing fills the air Two thousand years and still the flame Is burning bright across the land so So next Sunday, it's Christmas. Bless you as you go into this next week and bless you next Sunday. May you know the gifts of peace and hope and joy and love lighting up your Christmas. May God bless you. Amen. <laughs>